Welcome to the latest edition of the Hudson County Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Haig, and just as a reminder that the Hudson County Sports Podcast is brought to you every week by our great sponsors at Stan Sports Center, which is located at 528 Washington Street in Hoboken. The telephone number there is 201-798-4466. And our latest new sponsor, which is Strulowitz and Gargiulo Twin Barrel Physical Therapy, located in Ardone Place in Jersey City. And the telephone number there is 201-792-3840. With me today is a very special guest who I've known since he was a young young teenager coming up in the athletic ranks. And he just kept going and going and going. And uh, both as a football player and a baseball player. Um, and uh, his, his status just kept growing and growing to the point where he was named in 2005. The Hudson Reporter uh, Athlete of the Year, which um, it was symbolized being the top athlete in all of Hudson County. And then from there on, he went on to play football at the University of Virginia. And then he finished up his career at California University in Pennsylvania. And he uh, had a great, almost had a chance to, to be playing professional football. As a matter of fact, I think he came close. We'll talk about that. Um, but it is my special guest, Mike Brown. Mike, how you doing, buddy, today? Hey, how you doing, Mr. Hey, how's everybody doing out there? We're doing quite well. Mike is called, Mike, we're talking to Mike. He's in, uh, in Venice Beach, California, and it's a lot better than, uh, right now where I am in Kearney, New Jersey, that's for sure. So, <laughs> all right, so let's turn, let's turn the clock back, Mike, uh, to your younger days, and you grew up in Jersey City, and whereabouts? What street? So I, I actually grew up in Newark, New Jersey. Oh, you grew up in Newark. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I grew up in Newark, New Jersey, but my dad was from Jersey City. He taught at St. Mary's High School. Um, so I went to grammar school in Jersey City at St. Mary's. Uh, played in the CYO leagues against uh, St. Owls and our St. Owls was just in those teams like that. So I grew up in Newark, but I played in the Greenville section of Jersey City, most of my sports. Okay. That's it, and that's where I got to meet you. See, so I always thought that you were from Jersey City. See, I, I learned something new every day. All right, what well, what was it like having two places to grow up, both Newark and Jersey City? And talk a little bit about did you did you hang out with friends in Newark, and what was that like? And then did you come to Jersey City and hang out with friends there? So what was it, what, what was it like growing up in those uh, in those two uh, two different municipalities? It was great. I mean, because we got, I, I got the privilege of playing well for both kids. Uh, actually, when I lived in North, my dad always wanted the best for me. So he took me to South Doris to play Little League and Pop Warner. So those kids were a little more kind of suburban type kids. And I was in the kids from Jersey City were super aggressive and they were from the inner city. So it, it allowed me to kind of transfer both ideas back and forth to each other. And it, uh, the dynamic of both really, really was good for my progression, both socially as well as uh, physically. Okay. And then um, w- growing, growing up, what was, was there a sport that you liked better? Did you like baseball better than basketball? Did, or bas- uh, basketball. Did you like baseball better than you like football? Or did you like football better than baseball? Definitely baseball. I mean, growing up and playing in Greenville and uh, Cave and Point, I can remember Mr. Ford at Ford Rest in Peace. The kids used to wear these Stars of Tomorrow shirts, these, 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 these Dodger uniforms. Um, they're probably they're probably in somebody's basement now that <laughs> I'm seeing those jerseys and saying, "Wow, one day I want to wear that jersey." And that that kind of like started my kind of sports aspirations. Is those Star uh, Tomorrow jerseys that the kids used to wear at Cape Point. Okay. So, and did you did you enjoy playing down at Cape Point with the Stars of Tomorrow teams? You know, was that was that good for you? And and obviously starting your relationship with with Mr. Ford. Yeah, I mean that was great. I mean that that could be said to be the greatest time of my sports trajectory because it was pretty much local kids from Jersey City. We had all played little league and whatnot together in different leagues or various leagues. Mr. Ford kind of encapsulated that moment, and, and we all kind of trained together. Um, and then we all went out and played together. So we traveled all around the country. I mean that was my life. I mean those kids that. I played on that team with. I'm still very close friends with today. What? Why don't you mention some of those? Who are the, some of the kids that you played on that uh, that Stars of Tomorrow team with? Oh man, we played with uh, 
Nick Clearis. We played with Jonathan Neps, the late Jonathan Neps, rest in peace. God bless him. Uh, we played with uh, Wilma, Wilma Valdez, who coaches at St. Mary's, Andrew Laguerre, who's Pat Laguerre's son, who's the coach at St. Peter's Prep. I mean, the list can go on and on. I remember <clears throat> some of the older guys, like Pete Duda, that was on the team before us. It was just a long list of local guys. Like, you have so many of these teams that have traveling guys who they pick up from these townships. I mean, we had all Jersey City kids who kind of just, uh, under Mr. Ford's direction, kind of encapsulated the moment. I mean, we were one of the best teams in the country, without a doubt. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> all right, so that, that was where you got your baseball start from. Where did football, where did your football start come from? Was that in, in Newark and South Orange? Or did you play in Jersey yeah, City, that, too? That promise, that promise mostly came in uh, Essex County when I was coming up as a youth for an organization called the East Orange Rams. And it's so ironic because later on, the kids that I played with with the East Orange Rams were transfers to St. Peter's Prep when we won the county championship when I was a junior. So that's why I mention that now. But my prowess in football came in Essex County. Um, but I can remember my dad saying, this guy with a buzz cut, his name is Rich Hansen, and <laughs> he's going to be at his camp tomorrow. Um, so I had no idea what Coach Hansen looked like when I was in the seventh grade. But I did attend pre uh, Preps camp. And based on that description, you know, that's the first time I met Coach Hansen. Okay. All right. And now I was just reading, uh, before we started the call, I was reading the Athlete of the Year story that I wrote about you in 2005. And in it, we t it talks about... Hanson, knowing fully well that you had a hell of a lot of talent as a be, as an incoming freshman, you weren't even enrolled in the school yet. You were an incoming freshman, and he took you to the seven on seven uh, drills at Rutgers University, and that was your first taste of varsity football, and that was Hanson's first chance of getting to see you run and play and defend and defend passes and what have you. Uh, what was that like for you? Being a 14-year-old kid, getting a chance to play uh, basically varsity football against guys that were three and four years older than you. Yeah, I mean, I, I can remember like it was yesterday. Once again, it's an attribute to my dad. Um, he always like kind of pushed the envelope on where to go and where not to go. So I think we knew that Prep was playing a seven or seven at Rutgers. I think my dad just got us up in the morning and took me down there to like watch it. And I don't know if people can believe it or not, but they threw me in the game. Coach Willie Wilkes, Coach Hanson, they threw me into the game. And miraculously enough, on like the second play of the 7-on-7, seven seven, I caught an interception. So it was, um, it was a push for my dad, but it was definitely the opportunity was presented. Okay. All right, so you enroll at St. Peter's Prep, and you have instant success, not so much as a baseball player, because you didn't play varsity as a freshman, but as a football player right away. You were on the varsity as a freshman, and you started. And what was that like, getting a chance to play varsity football right away for one of the best programs in the, in the, in the state? I mean, it was easy. It was easy, huh? Okay. <laughs> All jokes aside, um, at that point in time, St. Peter's Prep had an all-season program, which is pro was probably uh, – very advanced from what they was the, I mean it was probably up to par with some of the programs that they have now. So guys like me, Rashad Jackson, we had got the chance to come into the program during the summer, maybe three or four months before the season, and uh, train physically, kind of get in the film room. So so when I came to St. Peter's Prep, I was mentally and physically prepared to play football at that level. Although I may have been the first. Freshman to start. By that time, St. Peter's was high and high gear with the postseason program. Okay, and you were the you were the first freshman to start, and more importantly, um, it started an incredible trend of of your success, both as an offensive and defensive football player. Um, at first, you didn't make you didn't make all county as a, an offensive player, but you were first team all county as a cornerback right away as a freshman, and one of the few to make first team all county for four years. And um, did, did you just have the ultimate confidence in, your, in, you, in yourself in the fact that you were able to do what you were able to do in terms of defending passes, getting interceptions, and that type of thing? Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said before, like, I said, 
St. Peter's, the, the success of St. Peter's not always lies in the talent, but the production behind the scenes, the pre-production, and it eventually comes down to post, post-production. But when I was uh, when I was a freshman, I knew the defenses, I knew what to look for, and then I started to learn concepts of things once I became a second and third year player. And by the fourth year, I mean, it was pretty much the polished game at that point. But tribute to them because their preparation in the film room and the weight room just gets you really ready to play football at that level. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to ask you the tough question. Did you like playing defense better or offense better? But you know what? I no, I'm talking about at prep. At prep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I love offense. I mean, offense. I mean, some of those games were so far apart in terms of score that we didn't get to play much offense. So, I mean, I definitely would have loved to play offense a lot more than defense. Okay. But you did play offense enough that the fact that you and your buddy Rajon Jackson, who ended up going to Virginia just like you and ended up going to the NFL for a bit, the two of you were in the same backfield, which was incredible to watch. Rashawn Jackson at 270 pounds had the best moves I've ever seen of anybody. He made a spin move against Hoboken that I still, I wish I have a mental image of that in my mind that he, he spun away from somebody and did a 360 and kept going. Where in your case, you were just the quintessential tailback. You just took the ball and ran. And, um, and you also had good moves too as well. And the two of you combined, Ready for this? How uh, about this? For I pull this stat out. You and Rashawn together rushed for 3,300 yards and 60 touchdowns. Wow. Wow. I mean, when you say that, I wish they could all, all those stats all be mine. <laughs> <laughs> Rashawn is still making moves. He didn't call me back yesterday. Uh, we both live in Los Angeles now. Uh, fortunate enough, about, about three miles away. Oh, wow. So you get to see him often, huh? I get this when he's not making moves and not answering my calls. But, yeah, we hang out pretty pretty often. Um, we hang out pretty much every Sunday. It's out there to hang out and catch up. Um, so we actually, fortunately enough, live about three miles from each other in Los Angeles. And that, that's funny. All right. And, uh, and, and maybe you're going to have to give me his phone number so I can have him as a guest on my podcast. All right. Now, I'd love to do it. All right, so now talk a little bit about that. What was it like to play in the same backfield with your friend? Um, and the two of you were so totally different in terms of players. He was a big brute. You were, uh, I hate to say, a little guy. But, um, you know, what, what, what they list you at, Michael? 5'10 and 190, maybe? Yeah, they, they listed me. I would say, like, well, Dave Leggett was one of my favorites. He would say, I'm not little, I'm just short. Oh, okay. So I, I, I had a strong stature. But you're right, me and right, uh, Rashawn shared very different dynamics um, in the back. So at that time, it was uh, Thunder and Lightning. Rod Day and the Tiki Barber would be the comparison that Coach, uh, Coach Hanson would use. Um, and they used that to our best ability. Me and Rashawn participated in the preseason 7th and 8th grade programs. So we were very familiar with each other. I mean, we kind of eventually knew that we would be the leaders of this class. So, I mean, me and him have had an extremely competitive relationship, but definitely uh, a really, really good relationship as we went to high school and college and live in Los Angeles now together. So, But it's definitely been competitive over the years between us. Well, well not a bad guy to be competitive with, that's for sure. All right. Um, Tell me a little bit about if there's anything that you have must you have to have a little bit of a regret, uh, Mike. Is uh, you guys never were able to bring home a state championship during your days at, at, at prep, and you came close. I thought the one year you were destined to win it. I think that might have been your junior year, where you guys were just absolutely blowing everybody away, and then unfortunately you were undefeated and ran into Don Bosco prep. And they beat you in the, I think in the state sectional semifinal. Um, yes. yeah. And then the next year, the same thing, although you weren't, I don't think the team was as good. But again, who'd you lose to in the state, in the state playoffs? Don Bosco. So, I mean, so what was, how tough was it to get that close to, you know, to reach in the, the pinnacle and then to fall just a little short to the same team both years? I think it's that. Now that my mind reverts back to it, 
I believe we play like some of the best teams in New Jersey State history. I mean, one team that Don Bosco had, Brian Toll and Michael Ray Garvin and Mike Teal, yep. who, who were all probably some of the best players in their position ever. Um, but then one year we lost to Brian Cushion and Bergen Catholic. Oh, is that true? You lost to Bergen? You lost to Bergen? Oh, yeah, okay. We lost one year to Bergen, so and he was like the, he was the NFL Rookie of the Year. So I think that we really just got cool with bad timing. Um, but you know, you know, things happen. We won four consecutive uh, Hudson County championships. So I really have no regrets because I really just think those teams were better than us when we played them. Okay. And you had uh, you, your teams won. Uh, I'm, you, I know you won ten games both your junior and your senior year. So you must have won almost forty games. In your four years of high school, that must have been that alone is it is an achievement and a half. Yeah, we didn't lose much in high school. I think I believe the only games we lost were maybe those those three games, those four games. Right in the state playoffs, that's it. So. Yeah, those four games. Oh, All right. How much how much of pride do you have in the fact that you're one of only a handful of players? I think the total is five. If I if I if I can sit and think about it for a while, I'll, I'll know exactly who the five are. But only one of five players to make all county all four years of high school. And how great of a feeling is that to be able to have that kind of a, a legacy that you leave as being one of only five to to uh, to make all county four years. that I made in high school, um, me and my dad talk about this a lot of times because there's been a lot of great players, but the all-county barometer is pretty much where you judge all-time stage, and that, that's probably one of my biggest achievements. But I definitely have to take, thank people like Coach Hanson, um, Coach Burgess, the track coach, um, as well as Coach Rabinovich, the baseball coach, who kind of allowed me to kind of try to manage and kind of do the things that I needed to do to be successful uh, for all four of those years of making all count. Okay. All right. And I know one of the other four is Will Hill. Uh, one, one of the other five, I mean, Will Hill made Gold County five, uh, four years in a row. And another one is Evan Rodriguez from North Bergen. He made Gold County four years in a row. And both of those guys played in the NFL. So that's uh, that's some good, uh, good, good company you're with. No question. All right. Um, all right. So now uh, let's talk a little bit about your baseball career. And um, and uh, you had major success there too. As a senior, uh, you batted uh, almost 400, but more importantly, you had 38 stolen bases and you caught only once, and you scored 54 runs. Which I don't know how that's possible to score 54 runs in a high school baseball season. And um, uh, what what was that like? You know, like for you to be the catalyst. Of those very good prep baseball teams, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you won two county championships in baseball too, right? Actually, actually in baseball, I won. Yeah, I won two county championships. We didn't win it. We didn't win it, my friend. Yeah, I won two county championships in baseball. Yeah, now did you play freshman varsity baseball? Yeah, I played. I, yeah, I played freshman varsity. I was on that team, but I don't think we won it with them blue skis. Yeah, I don't. I don't think so either. I think that was right smack in the middle of the uh, the memorial run. So I don't think. I don't yeah. think. Yeah. But yeah. and Hoboken also had a good run there too as well. But I think uh, I think he did win twice. Um, and you know what? So what was that like to you know to continue your athletic excellence um, as a baseball player? And there's and honestly, in my eyes, no drop off on the high school level between. You as a baseball player and you as a football player. And did you feel the same way? Did you feel you were equally as good in baseball as you were in football? I thought I was a little bit better in baseball because I had played baseball my whole life. Okay. In football, I was actually really surprised at how fast the success came in football because I was like a little nervous about the size factor and how it would translate. So I didn't know. But with baseball, um, I had been playing on the Jersey City Stars tomorrow, Mr. Ford's uh, Jersey City Cobras. So I had kind of been a, a fully tool skilled baseball player going into prep. And the kids that had played even on the varsity team, I had played with them and, and was pretty much better than them 
at that point already. So I was pretty confident in my baseball game um, from the from the very beginning that I came to prep. Okay. All right. Well, we will be back with uh, with more of our uh, podcast with Mike Brown right after this message that comes from Strulowitz and Gargiulo Twin Barrel Physical Therapy. For over 40 years, Strulowitz and Gargiulo Twin Barrel Physical Therapy has been caring for Hudson County athletes and people with modern and state-of-the-art offices in Jersey City, Bayonne, and Hoboken. You can count on Carl Gargiulo and his highly trained, experienced staff of physical and occupational therapists to help you recover from an injury, get post-operative care, or reduce your pain and help you get back to doing the things you love to do. From back pain to balance difficulties, sports injuries, and joint replacements, Carl and his staff will help you regain movement, resume activities you love, and recapture your independence. Carl's phone number is 201-792-3840. Please feel free to call Carl directly with any questions and visit their Hudson County offices or the other 42 Twin Barrow locations throughout New Jersey. To learn more about Twin Barrow and physical therapy, please visit the website, which is www.twinborough.com. Strulowitz and Gargiulo Twin Barrow Physical Therapy is an in-network provider accepting all major insurances, and I can fully well attest to um, their brilliance at uh, Strulowitz and Gargiulo because not only are they a proud sponsor of the podcast, but I'm also a patient. I've been going there now on a regular basis uh, for the last eight years, and there's no question that I am walking today because of my relationship with Carl Gargiulo and Strulowitz and Gargiulo Physical Therapy Twin Barrow. So uh, please check them out. They do a phenomenal job, and they, they help me uh, as a personal uh a personal sidelight, they've helped me to be able to walk again and get around. So I'm very, very grateful to Carl and his wonderful staff. So, all right, now we're back with Mike Brown. And Mike, okay, talk a little bit about your now decision after having a brilliant high school career. And then talk, to, first of all, too, you also ran indoor track and won a state championship in indoor track in the sprints, correct? Yes, yes, we did. That senior year, uh, I wanted to try to win a champion down in Princeton and won the 16 meters dash for state championship. Okay. That's amazing, too. So that just adds to your legacy of how great your athletic career was. All right. So what, now you got uh, three sports to deal with. Obviously, track is probably the third in the, in the level, but still, you know, you're a state champion. Um, when it came to getting recruited, how wild was that to have all these colleges uh, coming and knocking on your door and calling you and sending you letters and emails and what have you um, and getting that kind of attention? Um, it, it, was a, it was truly amazing. I mean, he was a guy from Hudson County. His name is Mark Donofrio. Sure. I believe he from North Bergen and the Green Bay Packers. But he was the first recruiter that we ever met. And he worked for Russia, uh, Rutgers with Graciano's first staff. And we came up with a bus load of about 15 guys. And in front of us, Coach Anafia, who had never seen us before, gave, named each one of us individually. And he was like, holy shit, this guy really knows, knows us. And that was the first uh, example of like how intense that type of recruitment was. I mean, me and Rashad mostly visited together. We went to Penn State, uh, we went to Nebraska, we went to, out to USC. We, uh, we pretty much had offers from pretty much every school from the eastern part of the country in the Big Ten. Absolutely. Okay, so how difficult of a decision was it for you to pick Virginia uh, as, your, as the school to go to? And was it part of the plan that you and Rashawn would go together? Everything seemed the same to me. It didn't matter if I went to Rutgers or Virginia or Penn State. I was just interested in getting on the field as fast as possible. So it was really my dad who made the decision on where I would go to school. Um, we at that that time, Virginia, we had the number one recruiting class in the country. We had the number one player in the country, Eugene Monroe, who was from New Jersey. Right. Um, at that time, Brian Cushing had made a verbal commitment. Um, and then we had a few weeks with the number one class in the country. So um, 
I guess Rashawn one day came to me and said, I'm going to Virginia. And I said, okay, cool. And Coach Sanafio, who I mentioned before, who was at Rutgers, ironically, was now coaching at Virginia. And him and my dad had a real good relationship. And one day my dad just kind of told me, hey, you going to Virginia to play for Coach Bro. <laughs> that was it. Your father made the comment and, that, and you had to listen to what he said. All right, that's not bad. Well, okay. Um... Were you at all, at all surprised with the amount of, of um, attention that you received as a football player, despite the fact that you didn't have, you weren't blessed with a lot of size, and you know, like you were, a little, you have to admit, you were a little undersized, no? And were you a little surprised with how how much the colleges were were really into you? Well, I think the trend of football has now where it is now started to evolve about my time, around 15 years or so ago, is that the size of the defensive players didn't necessarily matter because the game would be more spaced out. You would get 50 to 60 passes a game as opposed to 20 to 30. So you needed guys that could run. You needed the guys that could tackle. And I think that that's where that's why I was able to play at St. Peter's Prep as a freshman, and I was able to start at the University of Virginia as a freshman because I was able to tackle so well and be so physical um, thanks to that foundation at St. Peter's Prep. But I was always able to tackle, I was always able to play in space, and I was always able to run, which are unique qualities for a defender. But when the game is spread out, I mean, I think that trend started with players like me 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, and Mike, let's don't, don't sell yourself short. You were the best cover corner I've ever seen on the high school level. You could cover anybody. And no matter who it was, you were right there like, you know, like a, uh, a fly in a, in a picnic. I mean, seriously, you were you were the best cover corner I've ever seen. And did you take pride in the fact that you were as that good of a cover corner? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, that part we had a coach really Wilkes. I mean, he, he drilled me every day. And that's why I was able to take advantage of strengthening other parts of my game, such as understanding concepts, uh, being physical, helping other teammates, because I had that great foundation of coverage from the very beginning. Okay. And, um, and really, obviously, did not have the speed that you had and did not have the ability to be a cover corner. But uh, Willie's a great friend, but he made the biggest interception. Now I think it's the second biggest interception in the history of St. Peter's Prep football and the fact that he uh, intercepted the ball uh, at, and led Prep to its first ever victory against North Bergen at, in Breslin Field in Lyndhurst. And the legend has it now that, that that interception return was about 235 yards. Um, and, you know, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. So Willie, Willie knew, and Willie played uh, defensive back at Rutgers, so he, know, he knew what it was like to, to be a cover corner. But he didn't do it like you did, there's no question. But he had a little bit more size than you did, but he did, certainly couldn't be a cover corner like you did. So and were, there several, were there certain um, drills and, and things that you did on your own, Mike, to, to make you become a better cover corner? Brooks because he's, he's, I mean, he's pretty much my tutor um, in terms of everything. We, we recognized each other from the beginning, um, and he kind of just took me under his wing. I think he even retired, maybe after, after a year or two after we left. But um, his son, Khalil, yep. uh, his whole family, we're really close with. Um, so he, I mean, he's always been around and things like that. But it was really my father just taking me to different camps, you know, where we would go on. Um, to some of the camps and things like that. Learning uh, defensive back drills. At that time, YouTube was brand new, so I was on YouTube a lot and look at the drills as our can as that seems now. But um, those are things that I used to do. I used to watch cassettes when I was a kid that seems ancient, but I used to watch everything football, everything sports that I could watch. Okay. All right. So um, what was it like now you decide to, to go to Virginia if you have all those other offers? And I'm going to say – and, you know, looking at the story that I did about you being the athlete of the year, you had over a hundred offers, um, which that must have been really, really tough to weed through uh, the ones and narrow it down to say ten, and then five, and then finally um, deciding on Virginia. So, um, so when you finally make the decision to go to Virginia, were you excited, nervous, a little of the above, a, 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 you know, a lot of the above, or what was it like for you to go to Virginia? It was definitely exciting. It was definitely a little nervous. Um, 
is just because of the, the scale of everything, you know. When we went to one of the games, you know, I looked up at 60, 70,000 people, and I was like, wow, this is bigger than me, as opposed to maybe when I was at prep, the depth and towards the end of my career, I was like, I own Cochran's Field, I own Cave and Point, this is my field. So when I got to Scott Stadium, um, but then eventually going around to stadiums and ACC and the SEC, and I started seeing TV and film productions of the games and things like that, and merchandise being sold and things happening. I was like, wow, this is a little bit overwhelming. Okay. But you handled it well. You were all uh, ACC rookie. You made the all ACC rookie team as a freshman. You started right away at Virginia. Um, and so obviously Coach Grow and Coach D'Onofrio knew your talent. And you had a very good freshman year. Right? And then, unfortunately, things started to turn sour for you. Uh, as a sophomore, and what was this, like in the second or third game of the season, you hurt your knee? No, actually as a sophomore, I had my best season. I think I... Oh, is that true? I apologize. In my, yep, in my junior year, I hurt my knee, but in my sophomore year, I think I finished second in the ACC in punt returns. I returned over 50 punts that year, um, and I'm more sure was a special teams player that year. I think I recorded 25 tackles because I actually did a little looking before this interview, but I recorded 25 tackles on special teams in the ACC. So that was probably, um, I took a step back from defense and I actually went more of uh, Coach Bob Diaco came when I was a sophomore. I think he's the head coach. Well, he's not the head coach in Notre Dame, but I think he's the head coach at Purdue now. Okay. And um, he was another Jersey guy. And he just exclusively used me on special teams to return punts, to return kicks, to to kind of gun and stuff like that. So my second year, I believe I had a incredible season. It was like probably the best season that I ever had. That is scoring touchdowns and do anything of that matter. Okay, and you went to you went to bowl a good bowl game too as a as a sophomore, right? Yeah, my freshman year we played Minnesota and lost Maroney in the bowl game in Nashville, and we won that one. And then my sophomore year. We played in the Gator Bowl against Texas Tech. Yeah, right. I knew that was a New Year's Day Bowl, right? It was, yep, it was a New Year's Day Bowl. They had Michael Crabtree and a few other people. It was a pretty big time bowl. Okay. All right, so now things are going well for you. And I, and I apologize for not realizing that your sophomore year was a, was a good year. All right, and then what happened um, when you hurt your knee? Did it happen in a game or did it happen in practice? What, uh, what happened there? Summer practice preparing for a junior season, which I was slated to start a corner. I was coming back with a ton of preseason accolades. I mean, I, I really felt my feet on the ground. And one day in practice, a simple seven on seven, um, me and another player knocked knees. And I didn't think it was that serious, but it happened on Friday. And I remember waiting a day or two. And then on day three, it blew up. And I went in, and uh, they have an orthopedic surgery, not a, a surgeon there. And they told me that my ACL was torn, and I would have to miss the, my junior season. The whole season, yeah. You had to have reconstructive surgery. And how difficult was that for being somebody so active your entire life? And now you're 21 years old, and you face this adversity where you can't do anything except worry about rehab. And that's, uh, that's got to be really, really frustrating, no? It was difficult. I mean, nothing, nothing negative probably ever happened to me at that point. I mean, I grew up with both parents, I had a brother and sister, you know, my friends, my family. I had a successful career at prep. I had a successful two years there. I think my dad had just bought me a new car. You know, things couldn't have been better. But um, but this, this unfortunate thing happened. So it was definitely tough. It was definitely tough mentally. Physically, uh, emotionally, a lot of things are tough at that point. Okay. All right. And then I hate to bring up the bad, the bad part, but uh, unfortunately, it's it's part of your life. Um, soon after, you were involved uh, first in an incident on campus, and then then the worst part was that you were arrested and charged with uh, three counts of uh, of larceny and uh, for stealing what they thought was stealing uh, equipment, um, uh, recording equipment and what have you. And um, looking back, Mike, how bad of a mistake was that for you to do? Uh, and is that, is that the, probably the lowest point of your life? Um, I wouldn't say it was the lowest point of my life, but it is, it is definitely a low point in my life because, 
because I was from Hudson County and I was a representative of Hudson County and I feel like I let the people of Hudson County down. Initially, maybe, I mean, now that I'm an adult and actually that, that is actually a pivotal story in my life to all the successes now, it's, uh, it's definitely like easy to talk to about or it's easy to talk to younger kids about um, now as like, a, like a, as a pivot point. But um, at that time, being that young and that close to my people in Hudson County, I definitely felt that shit, I let Hudson County down. And that's what weighed on me most and what uh, me personally thought about it. Okay. All right. Uh, and then what happened with the case? Did it, did the charge, were the charges dropped? Did you, did you take a plea? What happened there in terms of uh, not having to go to jail? I mean, the situation was pretty simple. I had a hurt my knee. And at that time, I wasn't necessarily involved with the team, and I was hanging out with people from the town. So eventually, the, the masters of the charge got, charges were dropped, and I was charged with trespassing, which seems my move now, but it actually affected my career on the floor, whether it was from reputation or, you know, whatever it was from. But it eventually was a trespassing charge, which, which seems minimal now, but it was, it was very damaging. Okay. And then, unfortunately... Um, Virginia, I, I don't know if they took your scholarship away from you, but uh, Coach Grow publicly said that, quote, Mike Brown is no longer part of the Virginia football program. How devastating was that for you to, to, to hear Coach, uh, Coach Grow uh, say those words? Well, you know, it was, it was definitely devastating because I had played for Coach Grow as a freshman. Uh, Coach Grow had come to my home, so... He was more so of my, uh, my guy. But I think, you know, I mean, this was 20 years ago, and I see some of the events that happened in Charlottesville now. Um, wow. Just recently with the era and stuff like that. I think Coach Rowe and the administration in Charlottesville, in particular, probably have a lot of different pressures from a lot of different points putting them on, uh, putting them, on them to make decisions. Because I know Coach Rowe, we went to his birthday party maybe three years ago. And we still have a pretty decent relationship, so I just think the dynamic. Um, he has a co he has a good relationship with everybody. He's one of the nicest yeah. men that ever was Keyshawn on the planet. Johnson. Johnson. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's the only one. But 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 but, but in terms of Co Coach Grow uh, handled the pressures of being a head football coach with the Jets very well, and he treated me very good because I covered his son. Uh, when his son was playing at Randolph High School. So we had a very, very good relationship. And we always spoke when I would call him to talk a little bit about you and Rashawn. Um, he always spoke about you in the highest regard. And I think, I, I, you know, I, I still think he probably uh, cares about you a great deal and uh, knows fully well that it was just a bad mistake. That's all. Yeah, yeah, like that. Oh, yeah, like that. Looks like when I think that the dynamics down there politically in Charlottesville lead to some to not getting second chances. Yeah. All right. So now um, you still had some eligibility left, and you still had aspirations that you wanted to play at the next level. Uh, how does how did you go to California University in Pennsylvania? How did that all come about? Well, I got lucky because Coach Grow he made an agreement with me before I left that he would keep me on scholarship to finish out my undergraduate degree. I just wouldn't be able to return to the team. So I was able to stack in 21 credits in one semester, um, which allowed me to graduate from UVA. And once I was able to graduate, then I could go to a graduate school and, live and play the last year of my eligibility. Okay. And how did uh, California University come into play? How did you get that? Rich Rodriguez from Bayonne. You're kidding. Was, Ricky um, Rodriguez helped you? That's wild. Coach okay. Rich Rodriguez from Bayonne knew Coach John Luckhart at California University of Pennsylvania. And John Luckhart actually just got inducted to the College Football Hall of Fame. Okay. Um, last year, he was my former coach. He coached at Washington. Uh, he's, he's a West Pennsylvania legend. Um, so, um, Rich Rodriguez called me and he said, I got a school that's willing to take you, and it's a bunch of second chance kids. I see I, Netflix has a show 
second chance shoe. Yeah. This school that we went to was second chance shoe. I mean, we had Josh Porter, our quarterback from Maryland. We had Derek Jones from Oregon. I mean, we had Mike Brown from Virginia. We had a few. We had a, almost almost a full team of distressed, highly Division One players. So playing there became fun. It became you know just like second chance shoe. It was it was a blast. Okay, and and you played full time. You were you were uh, a cover corner again, right? You weren't just running back punts. You were co- you were playing defense. Yes, sir. It was it was it was great because we actually had four players on that team who played on NFL rosters, including one that still played, and he's in his twelfth year, Eric Harris, who plays for Atlanta. Okay. We had a uniquely uh, a uniquely talented team. So playing was just fun. You know, I had been, I had been, I had learned uh, defense from Coach Albro. I had played in that arena before. So coming down to the Division Two level um, and playing, I mean, it was just really just working and perfecting your craft every day, which was fun. Okay. Um, at that point, did you think that you had a chance to play at the next level because you know you were getting your second chance and you're doing really well? Yeah, I mean we. We had scouts coming to games. Uh, we had two slots on our team that was going to get, get invited to the NFL Combine. We just didn't know which one. They used to give the Division II schools a quota before the season. And uh, we were winning. We were in the national, we lost in the national champion. We had a great season. And uh, I assumed that I would, I would definitely get an opportunity to play in the NFL. Okay. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't they? Didn't also California University have a pro day that you did really, really well at? Yep, California University had a pro day, which I did, which I did well at. Um, and then, but it's it's Division Two, so it's kind of on a different radar than the San Bruno at Virginia. But then I got invited to a few other different pro days. Yeah, but running a four, you run a four four, uh, and you hit like you do, and you cover. The, you cover uh, wide receivers like you do. It doesn't matter what division you're in. You're uh, and you were once a Division One player. So I mean, so you had those things going for you uh, in your in your favor. But um, uh, so you did you now you didn't hire an agent. You just went about this on your own, or did you have an agent? No, at that time I didn't have an agent. But luckily, um, it's a New Jersey program called Test Football. That deals with a lot, a lot of NFL players, kids going to college and kids going to jet. And um, <clears throat> um, they took me in and prepared me for my pro day. They also served as kind of like a management slash agency uh, boutique. So they were the people that were handling pretty much my training as well as my kind of negotiations and persistence of the NFL. Okay. All right. So what was it like to watch the NFL draft that year? And what's that, the 2010 draft? Yeah, 2010 draft. All right, so what was that like to watch that draft? And obviously you knew you weren't going to get drafted in the first three rounds, but did you start watching it religiously, like say the fourth round, fifth round, and say, okay, maybe my name might get called? Yeah, I know. I mean, I have been around guys who got drafted number 12 uh, overall when we went to New York with Chris Long when we were in New York for Chris Long. So I had seen that aspect of the draft, but I didn't really know how it worked for latest draft picks or undrafted free agents. So I just made sure I kept my phone charged. I was by myself, and I just waited. I just waited. I just waited. Um, but I didn't know what to expect, and uh, unfortunately, the phone never rang. Okay, you never rang on draft day, but did you then uh, start to get calls about signing contracts as an undrafted free agent and going to training camp with, one, with some of these teams? Very minimum, very minimum. But at that time, I had, I had understood that at that time, I think about it now, it seems so weird. I was 24 years old. I had an ACL, I had ACL surgery as well as another surgery. I kind of was some rejection to a bunch of other people. I was kind of teetering on the process of starting my my adult life at that point. Okay. Um, Do you think, looking back, do you think your lack of height hurt you again? Well, it didn't hurt you at all when it came to going to college. But do you think your lack of height hurt you when it came to NFL scouts? That if you were if you were six foot tall instead of five ten, you might have gotten uh, a chance. Uh, when you put it that way, I mean, defensively, I would probably initially say, of course it didn't. But when you add in the other things, such as the knee injury, such as 
a red flag for the rest in college. You add those things in, it probably would have helped if I was 6'2 or 6'3 and had those red flags. But because I was the size that I was and had those red flags, that could have possibly prevented it. But from a physical standpoint, I don't think it would have. But in addition with the other things that I had on uh, on my sheet at that time, I think it, that, that's actually a true statement. Okay. All right, but um, you did have a chance to play professionally. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't you go to the, the CFL or or uh, one of the other leagues? Did you play arena football? Where, where did, or did you not play no pro football at all? No, we had we played a little bit with the with the Philadelphia Soul, but we didn't really play at that time. I was in a transitional period, and I just I just wasn't feeling. Not being at the highest level, you know, when I came to St. Peter's, right from the beginning, I was at the highest level. When I went to Virginia, right off the beginning, I was at the highest level. Even at California University of uh, Pennsylvania, we were the number team, one team in the country. So the sub, the sub football, other than the NFL, it kind of, it kind of, it just, it just didn't strike a chord with me. Okay. All right. Um, so now you're 24, 25 years old, and at least you have your, de- your college degree and from a great school like UVA. Um, what, what did you want to do now with the rest of your life? I wanted to move to New York City as fast as I could. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what was, I mean, I guess growing up in New Jersey and being in the shadows of New York City and being an adult and all of my friends from UVA were moving to New York and, uh, I just wanted to get to New York City as fast as I could. Okay. All right. Well, we'll be back with uh, with uh, the, the latest part with my with my special guest on the Hudson County Sports Podcast, Mike Brown. Uh, after this message from Stan Sports Center, Stan Sports Center is your local full service sporting goods vendor and authorized team dealer. They offer quality products and dozens of brands to outfit your team top to bottom. Stan's has proudly been supporting the local community since 1946 and is your one stop shop for uniforms. Equipment, online team stores, and so much more. Locations in Hoboken and Saddlebrook and servicing the entire tri-state area. Visit them on the web at Stans Sports CTR. That stands plural, sports plural, CTR dot com. And check them out on social media for their latest creations. That stands Sports Center located at 528 Washington Street in Hoboken. The telephone number there is 201-798-4466. And if you go to the stands and you mention that you listen to the Hudson County Sports Podcast with Mike Brown, you get a 10% discount on all retail items that are in the store. So if you want to go buy, you know, your Met and Yankee jerseys for the, the, for the season that, that's now just starting, make sure you go to stands. And if you mention the Hudson and, and talk to the great people down at stands like Danny and Lou and Todd and tell them that you listen to the Hudson County Sports Podcast. They'll give you 10% off on that Yankee jersey that you want. Although, you know, I don't know why anybody would want to wear a Yankee jersey. Um, and that's spoken as a true Met fan. Um, but um, if you go to stands and mention the Hudson County Sports Podcast, they'll give you 10% off. And it's not a bad deal just by me- mentioning uh, the Hudson County Sports Podcast and Mike Brown. So, all right, Michael, let's go uh, now. You now have now transitioning your life. From being a top athlete to now being a professional. And at first, you thought you, there was a way that you could combine the two. And for a while there, you were into uh, personal training. And talk a little bit about that. We, we, you know, what were you doing then when you, were, when you first moved to New York and started to get involved with uh, being a physical trainer? To the West Village in a small, tiny, tiny, tiny apartment. Um, and all of my friends from UVA, they came to New York, but they were all like bankers and lawyers, and they were like, well, this is a Series 7, and I didn't know what those things was. So I was like, what's the best thing without a prerequisite? So it was a gym named Equinox, which is in the city. Um, it's a pretty notable gym. And I went there to start work, to start as a personal trainer at Equinox. Okay. And how much did you like that that you were still now involved in sports? Um, I actually liked it a lot. I mean, it, I never thought about that I would 
being a personal trainer. Actually, I played football and baseball so much for the past 10 years. I never thought about what I wanted to be post that anyway. I always assumed that I would be paying that as naive as I was. But um, it was great. I mean, the conversation, it showed me that I could be applicable people, um, had good conversation. The terms that I had learned throughout sports um, resonated. The vernacular um, in terms of kinesiology with bodies and things like that. It, it seemed like it seemed like it was just another day at, at, at the office for me. It was very easy. <laughs> okay. All right, and then uh, and you did that for how long, Mike? I did that for about about six about six years about six years. Okay, all right, and then one major make the decision to fly clear across the country and take up life in in Southern California. Well, I um I like the beach. Okay. I like the beach. I was living in um uh, I had I stayed in New York. I have been in New York. I've been in New York for the past eight years. Um, and then the pandemic came, and I'm a big city guy. I know I love Jersey. That's where I was born, but I'm a big Manhattan guy to be particular. Okay. So I was living uh, in on Ludlow Street, right across the street from Cat's Deli. Um, living right across the street, the pandemic hit, and um, I was like, Jesus Christ, the amenities that I have in the city, such as you know the opera at the Met or restaurants or places, the museums, I couldn't use. So, uh, Wait a minute, did you just open up to us and tell us that you're a fan of the opera? I'm a huge fan of the opera. Oh my gosh, see, I, I knew that every single time that I do this podcast, there's always something I learn new every day. All right, so tell me a little bit about the what, what intrigues you about uh, the opera, and what's your favorite type of opera? Is it? Oh, my, my favorite opera is Mozart's The Magic Blue. I mean, I just love how... It's, it's acoustic in the opera house. Um, that means that everything works together in unison. So it's like not just the song which is represented in music, or not just the play which is represented in, in like just stage play, or not just a dance like ballet. It's all of these part, parts, including the orchestra, work, working together to give like the audience a feeling of what's being said. So the tone and the, the pitch of the singers. It, it, it expresses feelings, and most people, when they see the opera for the first time, they say, "Oh, it's boring, it's boring, yeah, yeah, yeah." But if you if you can sit through one or two of them, and you can see how the art is very, it's, it's the purest form of art, uh, you'll enjoy it too. So. Wow. Okay. We so we know something that we do. So how did uh uh so how did uh, uh, Venice Beach come into play? And who was it? Rashawn was there first, or, or you know, and did you decide, okay, I'm going to go out to California? Yeah, I think Rashawn stayed here. I think Rashawn played for the Oakland Raiders maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. He's just been here just the whole time living in Los Angeles. Um, and he lobbied when I was looking for a new place. Um, and then when I got to California, being from New Jersey, being in the city, and I saw the beach, and I saw the activity on Venice Beach in particular, and I mean, I got lucky with a great with a great living situation here. I was like, "This is where I have to be." Okay. All right. And now, uh, tell our listeners what you're doing now. And so, first of all, now, how old are you? Thirty-five. Yes. Okay. See, that's a good guess on my part. See, all right. So, tell people what you're doing with uh, with your life now. So right right now, I'm involved in a lot of different projects. As a matter of fact, I am. Uh, Rounding up some guys to get involved with a, a St. Peter's Prep project um, called the Marauder Map. With uh, Chris Caulfield being the president and kind of some of the guys from my class being involved with the prep and things like that, I'm looking to get almost like a directory of athletes and things like that, or just the, just the community of us together <laughs> so that we have a voice at the prep and then do some good things in the Hudson County community. Oh, that's great. All right. And Chris Caulfield is the principal, not the president. So let's, you know. Yeah, but Prep has a president now. Yeah, Mike Gomez, your former teammate. Yeah, she coached me as well when I was a freshman. Yeah, see? So, so you, have, you, you have that baseball, baseball connection with Mike Gomez, who is a wonderful guy. He's the president. Caulfield's the principal. I can't, uh, I can't say enough about the way the Miami Mater is moving, you know. And, yes, I am a proud graduate of Prep, too, so, you know. 
um, as you probably will fully well knew, I probably stuck that in your head, I don't know, about 60 times over the last 20 years. Yeah, so me and Rashana, uh, we, we've actually, that's what we were supposed to meet about yesterday. Um, we have a project called the Marauder Map. As some people know in Harry Potter, the Marauder Map is where, it's a map where everybody's allowed to be seen. So we were hoping to put together some directory for the guys uh, of the more recent classes. So and we can do some good in the Hudson County community and whatnot. So me and him have been really working hard on that for the last probably month or so. That's great. And uh, and and you don't want you don't want athletes from from way back when when uh, when prep didn't win a single solitary football game and uh, you know old old people like me you know you don't want that you want you want the younger guys right well well we're not so young anymore we're looking no you're he's, Mike you're still young you're definitely a young man I'm an old man you're a young man so we're looking for uh, we're looking specifically years 2000 and 2010 okay um, see. Beautiful. They're doing, and and it's a it's an incredible place. I always say that it was, other than getting married, it was the best decision I ever made in my life was to go to St. Peter's Prep when I was in eighth grade because the pressures were for, for somebody of my age was to go to Hudson Catholic or go to Marist. I could have walked to Marist and I wasn't going there. And uh, and all my closest friends all went to Hudson Catholic and I wasn't going there. I had I had it in my mind, say in I don't know fifth grade that I was wearing a suit jacket to grammar school just to get ready for when I had to go wear a suit jacket uh, to go to prep. So I was, I, was a prep, I was a prep guy before I even became a prep guy. There's no question. It was in, it, it was in, it was in my blood. And, and unfortunately, we were not as successful as you were so, in, in terms of high school. So, all right. So, um, so how much do you like living in California now? Is it, is a, is it a good place for you? Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I love California because it allows you to explore. You know, being from New Jersey, I never thought that I would be living in Hollywood, essentially, where I could see actors and movies and things like that. So, and know, is that something you want to get into, Mike? You want to become, a, like, say, a director or a producer? What do you want? What is what is the ultimate goal of it after graduating from the uh, from the famed USC Film School? Okay, and is that something that uh, now that you know you got you got through the first round of interviews, you are excited that, that that maybe this is a chance that you could finally get accepted? I mean, yeah. I mean, George, this is George Lucas's and uh, Steven Spielberg's school. So I mean, it was, it's I mean, it's a long shot. Don't yep. get me wrong. I never, I never thought twenty years ago or thirty years ago that I would be living in Los Angeles pursuing film, but. If it, if it goes well, then it would be it would be like a, like a few a true full arc of uh, of what I want to do. So that's a great thing to get into, and and, uh, and I I wish you the best of luck. And obviously, as you you mentioned, I wrote the I wrote the the uh, recommendation letter for you because you know how how highly I think of you, and uh, and I hope I hope it works out well in that respect. So all right, before we close, I just want to say. Um, I want to read something to you that I wrote uh, in 2005 when you were named the Athlete of the Year, okay? Quote, I hope that I can be the standard that other kids can be compared to, Brown said. That would be the ultimate compliment. I just set out to have fun and do the best I could 
in that respect, I, if I, that happens, I have accomplished my goal. And then I said, my final line was, while leaving a legacy of greatness for every prep athlete to follow from this point on. And that's no question you did that. And there were other people, um, I, you know, like, for instance, it was uh, Ayer Asante, who uh, was another athlete of the year um, that we just honored, I think, three years ago. And um, he was compared to, yes, Mike Brown. And, uh, and he said that, I, you know, he, he always looked up to you and wanted to be uh, as much of a good cornerback as you were. And a year had a very good career of prep, and now he's at Holy Cross, and he's doing well there. So there's no question you know that you had an effect on other athletes, and that's, uh, that's, that's the legacy that you leave as being um, a former Hudson County Athlete of the Year. So um, tell me about, a little bit about your personal life. Obviously, are you married? Do you have any children? No, I'm not. I'm not married, and I don't have any children. And I God bless. And they live in East Orange? They actually moved to Atlanta. Oh, Atlanta. Okay. Yeah, Atlanta. So my younger brother, Andrew Brown, who played football at FIU, he was actually, as well, a three-year start at FIU, um, Florida International. He played in two bowl games. Um, he started for Butch Davis down there at FIU a few years ago in Miami. Uh, he's, he's healthy and well. And my younger sister, whose actual birthday is today, um, she actually is a superstar of the family because she's an Atlanta firefighter. And she just oh, wow. Two months ago. Yeah, so I'm taking the back. And what's her first name? What's her first name? Her name's Deanna. Deanna Brown. Deanna. Oh, God bless. Yeah, so I'm taking the back seat in the family hierarchy now because she's a firewoman and, that, you know, she she wears, she wears the big pants in the family now. But um, In more ways than one. <laughs> Definitely. So I'm very proud of my family. Um, I'm very proud that everything they helped me do and help me do to this day. You know, I wouldn't have been able to do it without my immediate family, but that initial family with uh, Mr. Ford, who's probably the most important person in my life ever. Um, you know, I just want to thank the Fa, um, that family, and then the broader family of the St. Peter's Prep family, that includes you, uh, Coach Hanson, uh, Coach Rabinovich. Coach Pat McKeer, you know, um, Mr. Gomez, Chris Crawford, all these people that's out of the prep family, and then to the Virginia family, and then to the New York family, and then the Los Angeles family. So it's just it's just about family people that push you um, and recognize your accomplishments when it happens, and it feels great. And, pe and people that really, truly care about you, Mike, and stuck with you through your tough times. That's the most important thing. So. Michael, I, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. You were a great guest, and you were very open with me and very honest, and I appre always appreciate that. And going back to, you know, we've known each other now for 20-some-odd years, and uh, my respect for you is never, has never, never once did it ever uh, wane um, and, and fade at all. I mean, I always, I always liked you from the first minute I saw you playing baseball when you were 13 years old. Until now, so I wish you the best of luck in your in in your endeavors. I hope that uh, you get accepted into the New York uh, to the USC Film School, and uh, I would go. I when you have your your, your grand opening of your first uh, your first major motion picture, I want to be there for that. There's no question. Well, if I come to New York, I'll take you to the opera too. So you How about that? I would just don't take me to a Russian opera. Uh, Russian opera, though, I don't want that. Russian opera is not pretty. It sounds like a whole bunch of Jewish men bringing up phlegm. So I, I don't. So I don't want that. I want. I want to. The Italian operas uh, are be things of beauty. They are really beautiful. So.
together when I was when I was a kid. So even now, um, I follow your work, and I think it's important for people like you, uh, these legendary story, uh, sports writers, um, who continue to write, and they, they they're not like these new blog guys who just come into the game, but they understand the history of the sport, and they can make comparisons to older players and newer players, so that people can get the same spectrum. So I really appreciate you because I mean. It's like, I don't want to say it's a throwback, but it's essential that we have people like you in, in journalism because, I mean, without it, 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 it wouldn't have any validity. So I want to thank you for sticking true to your guns and staying who you were all these years. Thank you very much, Mike. That means a lot to me. So, well, thanks so much again for spending the hour with me. Um, and it means a lot. And I know a lot of people are going to really want to tune in and listen to this podcast. So thanks so much for contributing to my, uh, my venture. So, and we will, and we will keep in touch. There's no question. All right, I'll talk to you soon. Ciao. All right, buddy. Be well. And that was my special guest today, uh, Mike Brown, the former St. Peter's Prep baseball and football star who went on and had a good football career at the University of Virginia, and he's now uh, venturing in California and hoping hoping to get into USC Film School that he's applied and he's already got past the first line of interviews. So. What a fascinating young man, and he's had his, his trials and tribulations in his life, but he's recovered well, and he's doing really well as he, uh, as he moves on in life. Um, thank you very much for listening to the Hudson County Sports Podcast today. I'd like to thank my, my, the two sponsors, uh, Strulowitz and Gargiulo Twin, Twin Barrel Physical Therapy and Stan Sports Center uh, for being uh, showing the faith in, that they have in the Hudson County Sports Podcast and making sure that it continues. So i got to thank my two sponsors uh, so much for doing what they do. And I also have to thank my executive producer, uh, Johnny Haig, my great nephew, who um, without him there would not be such a thing as the Hudson County Sports Podcast. He helped me put this all together. And um, he's a great young man, and I, I, I'm very, very thankful for him to help me uh, now as we approach three years of doing the podcast. So it's uh, a great, great, uh, great thrill for me to be able to be able to continue this uh, for as long as I have. And I, without the listeners and without um, the sponsors and, of course, without the special people that, uh, that I'd get a chance to interview, um, it wouldn't exist. So i got to thank all of those people. All right. Uh, we'll be back with another edition of the Hudson County Sports Podcast next week. Um, again, brought to you by both uh, Strulowitz and Gargiulo Twin Barrel Physical Therapy and Stan Sports Center, uh, two great sponsors. I'm, uh, I'm Jim Haig, and thanks for listening, and we'll be back with next week with another edition. Until then, take care of yourself and be well.